Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's great to see everybody here. And uh, we are especially honored to be joined uh, by Conrad Anker, the man to my right. Uh, he's the captain of the North Face Global Athlete Team. And uh, he's a man who's been to the top of the world more than once. I'm talking about the summit of Mount Everest, the highest point in the world. He's been three times to the summit of Mount Everest. And we're gonna talk about Mount Everest a little bit in a moment. But first, um, I'm curious, Conrad, how does one become uh, a world famous mountaineer? And <laughs> it, what was your path to, get, to getting there? I was introduced to uh, <clears throat> the mountains by my parents at a young age in the Sierras in California. And after I went to university, I realized that being in the mountains was my, the happiest place I could be. And I started finding work with it. And here I am today. So it wasn't check the box or anything like that. It was luck. You started climbing and you never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still leading expeditions and still going? I mean, I know you're, you're known for taking on some of the most technically demanding climbs in the world, and, and, and are you still doing that decades after starting? I'll still get out and do trips, but I'm 51, and you're not as strong as you are when you're in your 30s. So I'll let the next generation go out there and scare themselves and open up the new difficult routes. What's the peak age for a mountaineer? Probably for Himalayan climbing would be in your 30s. So you have the experience to make good decisions, and your endurance is quite strong. So that's peak age. Uh, I wonder if you could, uh, we're going to get to Everest in a second, but it, maybe you could tell us uh, one or two of your sort of most favorite or memorable climbs in your career other than Mount Everest. Maybe you could tell us about some of the extreme conditions you've done. Well, one of the best ones is with Rick, who's in the room here. It was uh, 12 years ago, we went uh, to, Tibet, and we walked across Tibet to study the Tibetan antelope, uh, the shiru, with carts, and we ran out of food, so that was, <laughs> it was a good journey. That always spices up a climb. Oh, yeah, you come, you realize you don't need that much food, so <laughs> it was a good, and Rick, it, uh, it was great to be here and see you there, and so that was, to this date, both of us, it's one of our favorite all-time trips. Now, I think everyone is well aware of, of North Face, the brand, but what does it mean to be the captain of the North Face Global Athlete Team? What does the North Face Global Athlete Team do? We have uh, 70 athletes in uh, three different categories, outdoor, action, and performance. Uh, outdoor is climbing, action is skiing and snowboarding, and performance is running. And so we have uh, 70 athletes globally, so uh, recruitment, development, and retention of these athletes. And so it's a, it's a really fun job. I get to meet these youngsters and sort of set the expectations, the rewards, the benefits, and, and, and help them grow. So it's a fun thing. I like it. Mm -hmm. You're very well known for, uh, in 1999, being the person to find the body of George Mallory on the north face of Mount Everest, 75 years after Mallory may or may not have been the first one to summit Mount Everest. And I wonder if you could explain uh, what that trip was all about, who Mallory was, and sort of you know your relationship with Everest. Yeah, great. It was um, specifically set out in 1999 to look for the body of George Mallory, which was seen in 1980 by a Chinese climber. The news then went out to the Western world. So we were put together with uh, PBS and ZDF and NHK public televisions out of uh, the UK and Japan, Germany, and the US. And so we're specifically to look for the body of George Mallory. George Mallory was the pioneering English climber. He was there in 1921, 22, and 24, and then disappeared June 8th, 1924, with his climbing partner, Sandy Irvin. And they were lost to the clouds. So the question was, could they have made it to the summit 29 years before Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay did in 1953? Mm -hmm. And what was it like to find him? I mean, was it, was it like finding a needle on a haystack it was, at 29,000 feet? And yeah, we were at about 28,500 feet. So I was going on intuition. Um, having worked mountain rescue, the, the shape of the mountain, we still have eddies and things. So I was out looking specifically for the body. And it was a very humbling moment because um, as climbers and as business people, we always build what we're doing today on the previous generation's experience. and so. I was part of Mallory in, in that sense of, of a climbing community. And, um, but also very humbling. If you do these type of sports, you have to make peace with death and your own mortality. And when you see a body, it, um, it, it, it's, it's, very, it's very somber. It's a very humbling moment. 
and for people who don't know, generally people who don't make it to the summit who pass away, their body stays there. It's too dangerous to bring their body down. Yeah, depending on the conditions. Um, yeah. By and large now, we try to uh, perform a bur burial at sea. Yeah. So, um, And Everest isn't strewn with bodies, and it isn't quite as littered as the press makes it out to be. Um, speaking of tragedy on Everest, in April, there was an avalanche, an ice avalanche, and 16 people died, 16 um, guides, Nepalese mountain guides died. And I know that you, you've survived an avalanche, and you uh, have spent a lot of time on Everest and, and have a school, a mountaineering school, to train guides. So you're very intimately connected to these issues. Maybe you could just explain what happened, what, what the conditions were like. And, and we have a, a clip of some of the ice, but maybe yeah. start out explaining sort of what happened, and then we'll take a quick look at our clip. The uh, classic route and the most popular route on Everest is the south side pioneered by Hillary in 1953. And to this date, it's the most popular route. The challenge there is you have to climb up through the ice fall. And in the time-lapse clip that we'll see here, the first one is an overall view. You've got Why don't we Everest. go ahead and look at that while you explain it? Let's say. And an oopsie, so you have three of the tallest mountains in there. And um, you see the upper edge there is the catchment basement. And then coming down the middle of it, that tongue of ice is the Kumbu Ice Fall. And you can see how fast it's moving there. This is a uh, time lapse over a period of two years, a photograph taken every half hour. The cloudy ones are edited out. Now it's going back in reverse. And the sun shade line that you see there is the winter azimuth. So that's the shade um, from. Uh, Let's say there. And now a more detailed one, this is the ice fall itself. So we have an elevation drop of about 2,500 feet over a course of about 5,000 um, linear feet. So it's about a mile distance through there. And if you can see these big, massive chunks of ice calving off and breaking, we can see now the winter snows accumulating and then coming out. And knowing exactly where that tragedy happened on the 18th of April with the 16 Nepalis that were climbing there, it, it wasn't. It was just a matter of when. It's a very, very dangerous um, place to be. And for the people that work on the mountain, it is the most dangerous profession in the world. Are conditions getting more dangerous on Everest? And is the, you know, in your opinion, as someone who's spent a lifetime on mountains, do you see climate change affecting the conditions you know, yeah, on these peaks? I mean, if is, I. Is this yeah. ice movement, and, you know, is that related to what's going on down at sea level? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much connected. We can look at historical repeat photography. So the first photographers that went in there in the 1890s, we can look at their pictures, go to the same location, take a picture. We see change. We can look time-lapse photography, which we've worked with here. Jim Bailog has worked on it on the Columbia Glacier in Alaska. Very convincing proof of uh, glacial recession. And then the, um, the third way is with uh, infrared satellites. So you can see the depth and the volume of glaciers. But what we're seeing as climbers up there is, is drastic. Um, from the, the summit day on Everest used to be snow. The climbers would glissade down on their tailbone on the snow, and now it's just, it's just, it's rock, it's shale, it's very dangerous. Um, there's running water at the South Pole, which is 26,000 feet, something that probably hadn't happened all that often. Um, in 2007, I was on the north side of Everest. We had a rainstorm at 8,000 meters, um, about 26,000 feet. So, a lot of really things that are there. And one of the nice things about these videos is that we're able to study the high altitude, high angle cryosphere. So we have the glaciers, but then there's the, 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 case, the icing on the cake that's on the side of the mountain up there. And that, that's changing. An example of this is uh, in Mont Blanc in uh, the Chamonix area. Mm -hmm. They closed uh, climbing on Mont Blanc for recreational purposes three years ago due to climate change. It was so warm. So if you wake up in the morning and your driveway is frozen, you know how Ice binds everything together. And then when it melts, things start coming unglued. And the, uh, the French were worried that there was going to be a, a mass wasting event. A, a, a part of the mountain could slough off. And they didn't want to run the risk of having a, a lot of tourists up there at that time. I can't believe we're running out of time. But we are. And we have to keep moving. And so I just would like you to just give us, you're going to be running a morning activity bright and early tomorrow morning, yep. 6 in the morning. So explain to everybody very, very quickly why they should set their alarms and get up super early and get <laughs> out there. And you can tell us more about the mass wasting event while we're exercising. Yeah, we're out there. Um, I'm a road warrior. I travel for my work, and I enjoy it. Um, but I also want to stay fit. So I'll be sharing my little tricks of what I do to uh, maintain fitness. And 
what, which airports have good stairs in them. <laughs> SeaTac's got a great workout opportunity. Okay. Minneapolis, St. Paul, a couple few stretches and little things to do that, a walk. And so this would be a great way to say, if this was a normal working day, we'd get up and we'd spend an hour investing in our health. And then we're so much better with mental acuity and we're happier and we're smiler. So this is like the perfect way of, of what I would do when I was traveling not being able to get out for a full day of climbing. Great. Well, I will be there, and everybody else that's smiling tomorrow will have been there, too. So thanks Thank again, you, Conrad. Yeah. You go off and I'm missing. Okay, thanks.